everyone, and welcome to this second presentation of Monday Night Travel. This is week two of the Alps, and that means we are off to Switzerland. My name is Ben Green, and I have the great pleasure of moderating this event tonight. And now I'd like to turn it over to Rick, who will be taking us to Switzerland. Hi, Rick. Ben, thank you so much. And thank you to all you travelers who have joined us today for our second Monday Night Travel episode. You know, during this lockdown time, this amazing year of 2020, I've just had this desire to share my passion for Europe and my love of travel with people. I'm normally on the road going all over the country in the off season when I'm not in Europe. And we thought, hey, we can get together on Monday nights. So this is what we're doing. And it's just a joy to be able to share with you a little bit of Europe. And today, that little bit of Europe is the Swiss Alps. Now, this is a party. I've, um, I'd like to invite you over, but you're over here, uh, you know, digitally or virtually. I've got my glass of wine. I hope you got your wine or your favorite drink and your favorite travel partner. I'm drinking a little bit of beautiful red wine, uh, Vino Nobile di Montepulciano. It's uh, my friend Roberto Becchi's vineyard in uh, Madonna Bella, it's called. And um, I'm gonna be sipping on this. Actually, I've been sipping on it for the first showing and this is the second showing, so I think we're gonna have some good time. I've got my cheese board and some salami too. And uh, I'll introduce you to that later. I got my uh, blueberries and my mixed nuts and we're gonna, go to, we're gonna go to the Swiss Alps right now. Remember, this is our new season 11. Every two years for the last 30 years, we've brought you a new season. This year, we only have eight shows in our season because we had scripts, we had reservations, we had the crew lined up. We were gonna do two great shows in Poland and two great shows in Iceland. And then like the rest of our travel plans, that's the end of it. But we're gonna do it as soon as we get able to go back to Europe. So right now, we're gonna just get our screen fixed up here. We're gonna do that. Wonderful technology, I just love this stuff. And then we're gonna adjust our little picture and picture the way we like it. And I'm just thrilled to take you to the best of the Swiss Alps. Hey, I'm Rick Steves, back with more of the best of Europe. And I've got my finger on the pause button, so I get to interrupt the show all night long. And uh, you heard that lousy playing right there with the magic of our post-production crew. And uh, uh, we were able to tie in some beautiful Alphorn music at the end of this. It looks like I'm playing it, but I'm not. And notice how it leads right into our beautiful theme music by Jerry Frank. We're just having fun making European culture come right into your living room. I'm tooting the horn for some of my favorite mountain destinations. It's the classic corners of the Swiss Alps. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Switzerland draws travelers from around the world for its legendary mountains. In this episode, we'll see no grand museums, no great cities, just jaw-dropping alpine beauty and the rich and resilient culture of the people who live here. It's a land of dramatic mountains, laced together by scenic train rides and spectacular hikes. Famous peaks are made accessible by thrilling lifts, including the highest in all of Europe. We'll enjoy alpine life, from exploring glaciers to making cheese the old-fashioned way. Switzerland is small, just half the size of Kentucky. While it has great cities, most of the country is rural and mountainous. We start in Zermatt, at the Matterhorn, take the Glacier Express train ride, drop in on Appenzell, and finish in the Berner Oberland, riding lifts to the Jungfrau and the Schilthorn. So I just got to say, I love the maps because this lets you know where we're going to go. And we have great cartography department at Rick Steves Europe. And with each show, we have to try to teach as much as we can. How big is Switzerland? What's the scale? Normally, we can say this country is the size of Texas or California or Connecticut. 
there's no state out of the 50 that's even close to the size of Switzerland. It's the weirdest thing. So it's half the size of Kentucky. I was a little bit tortured. A big decision we have to make when we do one of these TV shows is we have 30 minutes and 3,000 words. How many stops do you want to have and how deep do you want to go? We decided to be able to just have a few stops and go deeper. You know, we love the Berner Oberland, so we turned to the Berner Oberland, and then we've never taken the crew to Zermatt and the Matterhorn, so we included that, and then we got to balance that with the most scenic train ride in Switzerland and Appenzell. In Appenzell, that's where we get the historic and the cultural context, and I love to inject a little bit of that cultural context within all the great sightseeing. Now, every one of our shows has the same formula at the top. You start with the tease, that's something goofy to catch your attention. Then you have the razzle-dazzle show open. Then you have the serious on-camera open of the show. Then you have the montage and the map. And then the sixth sequence is always called on-camera number six. That's what we call it. And that's when the show is actually getting going. So now we've introduced it, it's zero to 60 really quick, and now we're off and running. Zermatt, at the foot of the Matterhorn, was essentially built for enjoying the Alps. It's hugely popular with skiers in the winter and hikers in the summer. Let me just inject a little personal health problems. I had a nodule on my vocal cord for the first three shows of the season, all three Alpine shows. I'm standing on the porch of the big uh, city hall or something there, that I guess, and it's, uh, I needed to get a place away from the crowd so I had no extra noise and I'm able to talk softly, but that was as loud as I could talk for the whole shoot, and it was really frustrating for me not to be able to project above the crowds, but here we're able to show off the best of the Alps, and we're starting in Zermatt. Oh, by the way, I got the, that nodule It's the same thing that Dr. Fauci had, and he's, you heard how funny his voice was, and now it's okay. Wonderful operation, boom, the nudge was gone, and then take good care of your voice, and it'll take good care of you. With its many lifts, it's a springboard for countless trails and unforgettable viewpoints. The weather's great, and we're hopping a train to one of the most dramatic views in all the Alps. The Gornergrat Cogwheel train has been wowing visitors since 1898. The trip comes with sweeping views, first of the town of Zermatt, then of the iconic peak that draws so many to this region, the Matterhorn. The train climbs steeply into the high country. It takes us to over 10,000 feet where we reach the end of the line. Across the tracks, an old hotel solidly caps the Gornergrat Ridge. Grand views stretch in every direction. Stunning Matterhorn views demand the attention of hikers, but there's more. Monte Rosa is actually higher than the Matterhorn. In fact, at 15,200 feet, it's the highest point in Switzerland. And a thousand foot sheer drop below the platform stretches the mighty Gorner Glacier. It seems many of my favorite hikes start partway down my favorite lifts or train rides. Hopping off this train about midway, I'm in for a sensational yet easy hike. Getting to these exciting spots with so little work and so far from the crowds, I feel like I'm cheating. And I love it. There's just something about the Matterhorn, the most recognizable mountain on the planet, that attracts people. It's a dangerous mountain to climb. Each year, while well, several thousand make it to the summit, about a dozen die trying. And with global warming, the permafrost that keeps it solid is thawing, making falling rocks a new hazard. So every chance I get when I can relate climate change to what you see and experience in Europe, I do. You can really feel the impact of climate change in Europe these days. And this is just one of countless ways. I mean, the permafrost is thawing. I mean, it's you, the typical route up the Matterhorn you can't do anymore because rocks are breaking off and falling down on you. It's impressive how the resort of Zermatt is investing in all of its lifts. They claim they've spent half a billion dollars in the last few years upgrading all of their lifts, and it feels like it when you're there. 
This is the third or fourth time I had been in Jamaat and I had never seen the Matterhorn in all of its glory. I was there filming our scouting just uh, in the spring a few months earlier and it was completely socked in. I was so thankful. I was beginning to wonder if the Matterhorn even existed and then it came out and it was just, I was, you can imagine how happy I was. Um, remember when you're, when you're uh, traveling in the Alps, summertime is great, winter is great if you're skiing or hiking. The spring and the fall, not so good. I was there in the spring, all the restaurants were closed, the rest of the hotels were more interested in fixing things up, anticipating the summer crowds, and the weather was pretty lousy. So uh, factor that in to your travels. If you're ever making a TV show in the Alps, if you're like me, you're gonna be a nervous wreck because you can't control the weather. I set out 18 days to shoot the three shows that were running these three weeks on Monday Night Travels, and or Monday Night Europe, and um, you know, I, I scheduled a little bit of three days in every stop, just so we had the maximum opportunity to get some good weather. We were very fortunate. We got beautiful weather right across the board. Surrounding Zermatt, as if to enjoy views of the Matterhorn from every angle, are dozens of lifts and hundreds of miles of trails. As is the case throughout the Alps, handy signposts make it clear where you are, what's the altitude, and how long it takes to hike to various points. Zermatt, straddling its tiny river, is a small town of 6,000 with a big tourist industry. It has more hotel beds than residents, and they're often completely full. Nearly everyone earns a living one way or another from tourists who flock here for a peak at the peak. About two million visitors a year arrive by train. Cars are not allowed. Electric carts weave quietly through the pedestrians. The town is a collection of over a hundred modern chalet-style hotels with a well-organized and groomed infrastructure for summer and winter sports. And this crowd-pleasing herd of traditional black-necked goats, which parades through the town every day, has had it with selfies and is heading for the barn. If you explore a bit, you can discover pockets of traditional charm. 200 years ago, Zermatt would have looked more like this, little more than a gathering of humble log cabins. Zermatt works hard to keep its visitors entertained and tradition-loving locals seem delighted to do just that. We are about to enjoy a little yodeling. As we were shooting this, it took a lot of time to get up into the peaks and it always takes more time than what we hope to get the filming done and so on. And Zermatt, we kept coming end of the day and it was just hard to get what we needed to get to do Zermatt justice. And uh, as it turned out, we had a great fit on Zermatt. And, uh, but you'll see that like the goats that were heading home, they were done for the day. They were literally heading for the barn. And we jumped out of our little electric go-kart, to that's the, how you get around there, uh, to, to film the goats. And then we got into the town and it was a long day. We had just been shooting, get up really early to get those mountain peaks. And uh, the band here was heading home. And we just thought, oh no, we need the yodeling. So I found the leader. I said, is there any way you can get your people back together? And they agreed to gather there after their long day of making music already. And uh, then we said, and can you do that song three times? Because the cameraman, we only have one cameraman. I needed to get all the different angles. And it turned out we got some beautiful, beautiful yodeling. So here we go. A little look at Swiss culture music. Oh, my God. 
From the town of Zermatt, a mighty cable car takes us to the summit of a peak called the Little Matterhorn. Prices are steep, as the community has invested hundreds of millions of dollars in their mountain lifts in recent years. These lifts are absolutely state-of-the-art, and just experiencing them is worth the splurge. At 12,700 feet, this is the highest cable car station in Europe. While the view of the Matterhorn from this angle is not the iconic postcard profile, the views from this observation deck are stunning. On a clear day, the Alps fill the horizon with all their glory. Okay. We're at the train station. We're ready to leave Zermatt. You know, we filmed a lot more in Zermatt. I mean, the actual bit we filmed is about twice as what you just saw, but we had to make hard choices. And if we include Appenzell in the cultural history, we had to cut way back on Zermatt. We had a beautiful meal. We don't have to, we don't, we can't show it. We visited a little log cabin village out halfway up the hill and couldn't show that either. We saw a little bit of that in Zermatt town. And we didn't get to do the mountaineering history that was so interesting in the museum in Zermatt. Mott. But we, uh, oh, and we had a wonderful man from the tourist office who was our guide and he, he just, yodeling was in his blood. We didn't, he gave us yodel lessons, but it didn't work. But in the end of the show, in the bloopers, we'll see that in a little while, you'll hear his voice, you'll watch me lip syncing it. Uh, you know, there's, uh, I like Zermatt. I got to say, I really love Zermatt. It's the one place where you have good weather. It's worth buying the big grand lift ticket that gives you a pass for all the different lifts because just the lifts themselves are a lot of fun. This is one rare show where we don't have a full-blown meal, and uh, we missed that, but it just took time. But I've got a pretty good snack right here. I hope that you're enjoying this. Thank you so much for joining us, by the way. I've got my, my lovely um, Italian wine, and I've got my French cheese. I've got some triple creamy brie. I've got some Pierre Robert and some nice blue cheese. And uh, French cheese and Italian wine. Well, we're in Switzerland, and Switzerland has French culture and French language. It's got uh, Italian language and Italian culture, so I think we can get away with it. We're going to go now to the most beautiful scenic train ride in all of the Alps. And here's a case where we did take advantage of a little bit of stock footage provided to us by the tourist office. Sometimes we have to uh, use other people's footage. We try to use our own, but a few times it's just fun to have their footage also. You'll know what I mean when you look at this train ride. The Zermatt train station is busy each morning as travelers invest a day of their vacation to take one of the most scenic train rides in the world. Riding the rails across southern Switzerland on the Glacier Express. This journey, designed to maximize your sightseeing thrills, features a masterpiece of railway engineering. The Glacier Express train line crosses 290 bridges and viaducts, and goes through 90 tunnels in eight hours as it connects two of the leading alpine resorts, Zermatt and St. Moritz. Over a quarter million Alp lovers ride this train each year. People kick back and just relax, enjoying big windows for bigger views. The scenery unfolds as the train carves its way through the Swiss landscape. In the glaciers high above are born some of Europe's great rivers, which flow from here to both the Atlantic and the Mediterranean. Now we're trading away some of the staggering alpine peaks for an insight into the Swiss and their heritage. This is Appenzell, cowbell country and storybook friendly. According to legend, the devil was flying over these hills with a sack filled with houses. A sharp peak tore a hole in the sack and lots of chalets sprinkled over the countryside. To this day, the farms and hamlets remain widely scattered and the canton of Appenzell remains one of Switzerland's most traditional. That is so beautiful. I, I, I remember looking at this, how in the car we were just saying, let's stop there. No, it's going to get better. Let's stop there. And it, it's actually a challenge to know when to get out of the car and film or you're not going to get anywhere. I am so thankful for my crew. I've got Simon Griffith, he's my producer. He's been with me for every minute of filming in Europe for the last 20 years. And we got two great cameramen, uh, Peter Rummel and Carl Bauer. Carl shot this show. And all of our shows are edited by Steve Camerano right here in our Edmonds studios. Um, 
And I'm just really thankful for the artistry and the hard work that they put into this. We've all got the same mission of helping inspire Americans to get out there and explore the world. And uh, Europe is the springboard to making the world our friend. You know, in this show, you've seen some beautiful drone footage just right here. We, this is the first year we've had a drone and that drone can go up there and get some amazing shots. Uh, what I like to do is struggle with Simon, my producer. He wants to make it all beautiful TV. I wanna be the tour guide and pack it with information and cultural and historic context. And we weave it together. And it's to me that magic mix that, that gets the best of both worlds. And uh, you'll see how we compact the history and the culture and the context in the next two on cameras. You know, when you have some heavy history, you can't just show pictures because it doesn't cover it. That's when you talk to the camera. It's what's called an on camera. Notice in the next two on cameras, how we pack a lot of history and culture and context into the words, and then it makes the images you see and your travels a little more meaningful. The Swiss are famously independent, and historically, the big threat to their independence was the Habsburg Empire from Austria. In the Middle Ages, this region was fragmented into small cantons or states. In the 13th century, three of these cantons joined together to fight the Habsburgs. By 1291, they established their independence, and Switzerland was born. This union eventually grew to include 26 cantons and the country we know today. Switzerland is unique among its European neighbors. It's not in the EU, and rather than the Euro, it uses its own currency. This stubborn pride and the resulting survival of local traditions is one thing that makes Switzerland such a rewarding place to visit. Hey, he was just talking how Switzerland is different than other places. Let me show you an example. We've got the Euro coins. Switzerland is one of the countries not in the Eurozone. This is pretty old, but you can see that green island in the middle there. There's countries that may be in the EU, but they're not in the Eurozone. And way back in 20, what was it, uh, 2002, 12 countries out of the 15 countries in the Euros, in the uh, EU, decided to make uh, the same currency, the Euro. And I'm a coin collector, and this, I've always wanted to show this off. So thank you for joining me today, because I get to show you my coin collection. This is my Euro coin collection. And there's, uh, what, there's 96 different coins here. And in the original 12 countries in the Eurozone, of course, one side of the Euro is the same everywhere, but the flip side shows off what that country is proud of. A double-headed eagle in Germany, a harp in Ireland, and so on. Uh, now, what we have when we look at this coin collection is a chance to go out to those original countries and find the different coins for every Euro's country. Well, today there's more countries in the Eurozone and more countries in the EU. I think it was originally 12 out of 15 countries were Euro countries in the EU. Now it's 19 out of 27. And the new countries in the Eurozone, this is just trivia for you, are smaller countries, Cyprus, Malta, the Baltics, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Slovenia, and Slovakia. And if you're a coin collector like me, there are three little tiny countries that make euros of their own, euro coins of their own, but they make so few, they're almost never found in circulation. You gotta buy them in coin shops. And that would be San Marino, the Vatican, and Monaco. Remember, we're gonna have some Q&A after the show. So if you've got any questions, type them into that little widget that says Q&A. Let's go back to some heavy history in Switzerland. You feel the strength of that tradition here in the town of Appenzell. Amazingly, it wasn't until 1990 that Appenzell women were given full voting rights. This has been the capital of the canton for 400 years, and many of the buildings date back to that time. Switzerland's independence distinguished it from European high culture. Back then, it took royalty or the Roman Catholic Church to pay for big-time cultural achievements. So instead of lots of grand palaces and cathedrals, today, travelers see Swiss culture on a small and personal scale. Folk museums here given it. Oh yeah, I'm interested, like it's time for a museum. And it's a rainy day. When you're making a TV show, you wanna go inside when it's raining. And that's what we did here. We had terrible weather one morning. We went into the museum I just absolutely love. 
in that part of Switzerland to put together a little bit of cow culture and a little understanding. So we went in here and, you know, I know the museum's good. I know generally what I want to say, but I don't know what's going to be on display and what I'll work beside me. So we park our gear and together we walk through the museum and we figure out what we want to cover, what we want to say, make a shot list. And then we deal with the fact that this is a rainy Tuesday morning. There's only four tourists in the whole museum. We got to make nice with them so they can walk through the different scenes for us. So it looks like there's some people in the museum. It's really nice to get people to help us out. And sometimes we got to be very charming in order to make that happen. But take a look at this amazing little museum and how fun it would be to have that challenge of going through there and deciding what you want to include and what you want to say in just a couple of minutes. Ultimate peek into Appenzell's humble rural culture with rooms replicating everyday life from where they raised their families to where they worked. In this 400-year-old building, the ceilings are low and the floors are creaky with centuries-old beams. Simple folk art shows the importance of cows and the ritual of taking the herd up to the high meadows for the summer and back down for the winter. This room shows life as it was for the herder in the High Alps, who spent summers alone milking cows and making cheese. These decorative cowbells awaited the festive day when the herd would descend from the high meadow. It was a world of wood. The wood shop is where milk pails would be fashioned out of maple and fir, soaked in water to be made pliable, assembled watertight with no nails, and then artfully carved. The woodworker's bedroom reflects the pride he had in his profession. He earned enough to afford some fine painted furniture. This wardrobe dates from 1817. Whether traveling by train or by car, mountainous Switzerland has fine infrastructure, and you can get nearly anywhere in the country in just a few hours. The Berner Oberland is a particularly scenic region. Its Lauterbrunnen Valley, which stretches south from the city of Interlaken, is a wonderful springboard for some of my favorite Swiss Alp experiences. Lauterbrunnen Valley, with its vertical sides and flat bottom, is U-shaped, a textbook example of a glacier-shaped valley. While the main town, also called Lauterbrunnen, sits on the valley floor, neighboring towns hang on cliffs high above. Lauterbrunnen means loud waters, an apt name. Waterfalls plummet from cliffs all along the valley. Excuse me, I got a mouthful of cracker and cheese, but I just wanted to remind you, along that cliff, there's something called the Via Ferrata, the Iron Cableway. It's literally halfway up that cliff, and it's about three miles long, and you're carabinered up with clips, two of them, so if you pass out, you're not going to fall. You're always clipped with at least one clip. And you can walk with a guide all along the face of that cliff. I'll never forget doing this. You look down between your legs, and way in the distant valley floor, little tiny cows are down there grazing. And I really wanted to do that on this show, but we didn't have time. We didn't have weather. And I knew that there's so much content in the show that it wouldn't make it. But if you ever get a chance, Go on YouTube and check out the Via Ferrata. There's plenty of examples of the Iron Way, and the one in Lauterbrunnen is the one that's most accessible. Staubach Falls, one of the highest in Switzerland, drops nearly a thousand feet. The valley, with its riverside trails, traditional farmhouses, and chorus of surrounding peaks cheering you on is a magnet for nature lovers. Towering high above are the icy Jungfrau, Monk, and Eiger peaks, named for the legend of the young maiden, Jungfrau, being protected by the monk, or monk, from the mean ogre, or Eiger, and perched on a saddle between two of those mountains is the Jungfrau Yoke Station. And that's where we're going, by train. From the valley floor, a cogwheel train takes tourists and mountaineers alike on this ear-popping journey. As we gradually climb, the views continually unfold.
Eventually, we arrive at Kleine Scheidegg, a rail junction at the base of the peaks. For well over a century, this has been the jumping off point for rock climbers attempting to scale the foreboding north face of the Eiger. Kleine Scheidegg has souvenir shops, hearty food for hikers, and rustic 19th century hotels, a reminder that tourism is nothing new here. With I got to stop you right here because this, I think, is my most, one of my most exciting moments of TV production as a making on camera way I can remember. You can, you can imagine how exciting it is to have all the good weather going on and all this action and all this beautiful stuff we're going to put into the TV show. And to get the different angles, you got to be in the right spot at the right time. There's trains coming, trains going. You don't know if people are going to get up here or over there. We got to catch our train in six minutes, but right now we got something happening here. And if you miss that, it's another half hour till the next train comes. The next on camera is talking about how people from emerging economies, people from India and, uh, and uh, China and so on, are coming to Europe in droves, enjoying the wonders of Europe. It's so exciting to me that 100 million people in India can now afford to come to Europe, and 100 million people in China can now afford to come to Europe, and people from Saudi Arabia are coming by the thousands just to see the, the snow and throw a snowball here in Switzerland. So we, we have a chance now for people getting off the train to catch the other train to go up to a restaurant on top of the mountain called Bollywood, because in India, so many of the films are set here in, in Switzerland. And then I've got this on camera I'm supposed to do, and I'm trying to remember it, and I'm trying to know where to stand. And suddenly my cameraman says, Rick, stop. OK, rolling. And then I had to nail it, because I get one chance. If I don't, I miss this beautiful crowd. Check out the crowd, how it fits the on-camera script. Craze for social media these days, and with millions of people from countries with emerging economies now able to afford that dream trip to Europe, famous destinations like this can be really crowded. Do what you can to minimize the crowds. Arrive early, arrive late, it really helps. Continuing our journey to Europe's highest train station, the ingenuity of Swiss engineers is apparent as we climb the railway they built back in 1912. Amazingly, our train tunnels through the Eiger on our climb all the way to the Jungfrau Yoke. Think about it. The Swiss drilled this tunnel through solid rock. It's four miles long. This train is smooth, and they did it a hundred years ago. Why? To show off their engineering skills and to celebrate nature. Halfway up, the train stops at Panorama Windows. While expert rock climbers can exit here into an unforgiving world of ice and air, sightseers get their thrills by simply marveling at the icy views. Continuing up the tunnel, from here the train's cogwheels earn their keep. You emerge at 11,000 feet, the Jungfrau Yoke. Spectacular views of majestic peaks stretch as far as you can see. Cradled among these giants, you understand the timeless allure of the Swiss Alps. The Jungfrau Yoke is like a small resort perched on a mountain ridge. From the highest viewing point, you can see the Alich Glacier, which stretches about 10 miles to the south. While shrinking with the warming global climate, it's still the longest glacier in the Alps. The air is thin. People are in giddy moods. The station is a maze of shops, restaurants, and amusements. A tunnel is actually carved through the glacier to a cavern of ice sculptures, an especially big hit for visitors from lands where ice is a rarity. Outside on the glacier, people enjoy the scene. From here, many venture even higher as a snowy trail leads to more mountain thrills. But for me, I'll call this good and savor the sense of accomplishment I get when climbing to 11,370 feet before lunch. Yeah. Doesn't that look good? Oh, baby. Did I mention we're having a party? I just think this is so much fun. You know, it's perfectly safe, social distancing. We're sharing this travels. We do it every Monday night. I hope you can continue to join us. You know, I'm, drink, I'm drinking, as I mentioned, some uh, Tuscan red wine. If I was in Switzerland, I would 
be drinking some beautiful Swiss wine, but they don't export it because it's expensive and there's not much of it. They drink it themselves. I'd get a nice glass of uh, white wine called Fondant. A good budget tip in Switzerland is to order the beer. The beer is great and it's not very expensive. And uh, while I'm having my beautiful French cheese right now, in Switzerland, you would have your Swiss cheese and you'd have chocolate, of course, and you'd buy it in the grocery store chain called the Co-op. So you'd be having a picnic because it is really expensive in Switzerland. I want to remind you in a few minutes, the program will be over and we're going to have a Q&A time. I also want to remind you, if you want to see this program without all the pauses and for all the care and hard work we put into this, I hope you can see it without all my pauses. You can see that anytime on our website. All of our shows are available for free anytime at ricksteves.com. In fact, this is the annual gazette I produce for the, uh, all the programmers in public television. And the back page of this little four page newsletter is a listing of all the shows we have in rights right now in public television. And you can watch them on your local public television station or on our website any old time. I also remind you that this event right now like every Monday night travel event, will be posted on our Facebook page 24 hours later. So if you have friends that wanted to make this, you can remind them that every Monday we have two performances, two uh, events, one at six and one at 7.30. And we have a recording of this on the Facebook page the very next day. Okay, let's carry on in the Brunner Oberland. The Brunner Oberland has something for everybody. Part of the fun and much of the expense of enjoying the Alps is riding the various lifts. Funiculars let hikers gain altitude quick and easy. This lift actually lets visitors ride on the rooftop, a great way to more fully appreciate the staggering beauty of the region. And once again, it's fun to leave the crowds by getting off at an intermediary station and taking a hike. There's a special camaraderie with people who actually get out and hike. And within moments, you're sharing the experience with fellow hikers and enjoying the Alps in a way so many miss. Towns like Murin were developed to accommodate nature-loving tourists. They cater to your every need. You can stroll through traffic-free centers, and towns are springboards for a popular option, the electric bike. While service roads in the high country may be closed to regular traffic, e-bikes are more than welcome. And they make you look fitter than you actually are. Look at me motoring up that steep hill on my bicycle. That's the wonder and the beauty of an e-bike. It's my first time on an e-bike. It was great. These service roads are all over this corner, of, or all over the Alps, basically. And of course, you can't take your car there but you can rent a mountain bike or you can rent an e-bike and you can get around that way as well as hike. So it's something to keep in mind. Another form of transportation I never realized existed was a taxi up in the mountains. And later on in this day, we took a taxi on this road from Murin way up to a farm in the way up halfway to the Siltorn where we were gonna visit a uh, family making cheese. So we'll see that in a minute. We got there with all our gear easily by a taxi. Remote towns may be beyond the reach of your car, but all are accessible by various lifts. One of my favorites is the idyllic village of Gimmelwald. Look at Gimmelwald. Oh, if you know me, huh, you know I love this place. I left my heart in Gimmelwald, really. And uh, there's a few B&Bs right within view there. There's a youth hostel, one pension, one restaurant, and so much Alpine glory. Well, we came in, we filmed it a number of times. We wanted to do some new stuff and it's just on the fly. I, I, I just, we walk up and down the, the, the two streets in the town, see a mom with her daughter riding a little plastic toy tractor. Let's get that. Uh, see a farmer and his son uh, uh, shoveling the hay into the silo and then up on the mountain, cutting the hay and putting it on a tarp and, and, and going down the hill with his hay. I've seen them even sit on top of that pile of hay and ride it like a sled right into the barn. And then we call our friend Ollie, who you've seen in my shows. He's a school teacher in the town that runs my favorite B&B there. And Ollie's right there with us to help turn this uh, impromptu visit into a lot of positive serendipity. We went to the one restaurant and I wanted to 
show tourists having a great time in the restaurant. And we come in there and of course, most of them have this, uh, happen to have this book here, the Rick Steves Guidebook to Switzerland. And uh, they can be bit players for us in our TV show. So it's uh, fun to meet them, sit down as if we're traveling with them and let the cameras roll as we show another little view of my favorite village high in the Swiss Alp, Gimmelwald. The village, established in the Middle Ages, precariously on the edge of a cliff, was one of the poorest places in Switzerland. Gimmelwald works together like a big family. In fact, most of the hundred or so residents here share one of two last names, von Allman or Foitz. My friend Ollie, long the village school teacher, enjoys showing me around. This is the oldest house from 1658. And the woodwork is generally unpainted, just bleached in the sun originally hay up top and cows below. For generations, families have lovingly tended their vegetable gardens. They still are relied on to put food on the table, and this one comes with an artistic side. Retaining their traditional ways, farmers here make ends meet only with help from Swiss government subsidies. They supplement that by working the ski lifts in the winter. Modern tourism has contributed to the local economy as well. Pension Gimmelwald's terraced restaurant is filled with happy hikers at dinner time, enthused by the memories they earned with today's hike. I've been coming to Gimmelwald all my life, and it never gets old. With the world changing as fast as it is, I find it refreshing to know that there are places like this that still embrace their traditions. Dairy is the traditional industry here. Collecting grass to get their cows through the winter on these steep slopes is labor intensive. Each family fills silos with enough to feed a dozen or so cows. But we're here in summer, and the cows are in the high elf enjoying a diet of fresh grass and flowers. From their milk, some of the most prized cheese in the world is still made in the traditional way. Okay, we're gonna see a real farm family making real Swiss cheese in a real alpine meadow way above the village. And this is accessible. This is something I'm committed to. This TV show is not Lifestyles of the Rich and Envious. This is Lifestyles of You and Me. It's People's Travel on People's TV. That's a little line I use in my pledge drives. And what I'm doing in this little bit of the TV show here is really aggressively reminding people that as a tourist, you've got to take the initiative to have these experiences. The Swiss, uh, the, the, the tourist board in Murin nearby works very hard to put together a little educational tour to visit this family making the cheese. And out of a, you know, a thousand people in the valley, maybe eight people take this tour. It's wonderful. We crashed the party. We're just there taking the tour like them and we get to see cheesecloth in action. This is so much more real and better than what 90% of the tourists see when they go to the kitschy little tourist trap places around Gruyere. This is a real cheese experience. We're joining a small tour group organized by the village tourist office. Of the countless visitors in this valley, these travelers took the initiative to enjoy this intimate peek at local culture in action. Once the milk is heated to just the right temperature, the cheesemaker, using his teeth as well as his hands, masterfully scoops about 10 kilos of curds from the bottom of the cauldron. He then plops the sopping cheesecloth into a circular mold. It's quickly pressed to remove as much of the liquid or whey as possible. As the moisture is removed and the aging process begins, a wheel of wet curds becomes a wheel of Alp cheese, frequently brushed with brine and stored flat on shelves in a shed like this one for up to two years. In the high country, I also enjoy a chance to hear traditional music. And up here, along with yodeling, that means the long legato tones of the Alp horn. The Alphorn has a range of nearly three octaves. By the way, this wonderful man, when we met him up here at the, at the farm making the cheese, he said he was so happy to meet me. Ha! I didn't realize it, but he has been 
entertaining our tour groups for 10 or 12 years in Gimmelwald, and I've never had a chance to meet him. So it was just great to, to check in with him. Notice how we're able to put a lot of content into this little bit about an Alphorn. This is what our guides do on a Rick Steves tour, is give serious content to what otherwise might be just a touristic cliche. So here we are, it's a cloudy day, a great time to be making cheese and playing the Alphorn. And we got one more Alpine peak to check out, the Schiltorn. And I might have been glum looking up at the sky and seeing nothing but milky clouds, but local people know very well that it can be cloudy in the valley and beautifully sunny on top. We got onto that lift and we busted through the clouds and we had a glorious finale of our shoot in Switzerland. And it's a tip for all of us to remember that you can be depressed in the clouds below and break out of the clouds above if you're on the ball and you go with local information. When we got up there, I knew because of the barometric pressure or whatever causes clouds to move around, that this is a rising tide of cloudiness and we had to get our shooting done before everything was cloaked in clouds. You'll see that and that's a reminder to get going when the sun is right, get your sightseeing going high in the mountains early in the morning if you can. But with no valves, it's limited to the same notes as a bugle. Used throughout the Alps, this horn has played a role in this culture for 500 years. To call cows from pasture to the barn for milking. As a way for herdsmen in the high meadows to communicate with people in the valley below. And even as a call to prayer through remote valleys. Oh, and we've got time for one more Swiss summit. High above this meadow, a peak called the Schilthorn emerges from the clouds. And in good Swiss fashion, a modern cable car, the Schilthornbahn, zips visitors effortlessly to its summit. In the Alps, while the valleys may be blanketed in clouds, the peaks can be brilliantly sunny. Get an early start. The peaks are often clear in the morning and then cloud up. The 10,000 foot summit of the Schilthorn awaits skiers, hikers, and sightseers, both winter and summer. This station, which capitalizes on its role in a James Bond film, awaits with a revolving restaurant, perfect for spies nursing their 007 martinis. Meanwhile, on the Panorama Terrace, families pick out the peaks, while others thrill at 360 degrees of alpine splendor. For me, the majesty of the mountains is easiest to appreciate on my own private perch. As always, try to make a point to get away from the crowds, to be alone, to savor an unforgettable moment. Switzerland may be a small country, but its mountains are mighty, and we hope you've enjoyed this look at a few of its very best. Thanks for joining us. I'm Rick Steves, high in the Alps. Until next time, keep on traveling. So thank you so much for traveling through the Swiss Alps with us. I'm going to run it right now through the bloopers and the credits at the end. And uh, the bloopers are just a fun thing. I, I'm, it's so much it's so important to me to have a good time while we're filming. If we're not having a good time, we're not going to have a fun show. And uh, you can catch a little bit of the fun we have when you look at our bloopers. At the end of each show, because this is designed primarily to encourage and inspire and equip people to travel and go over there and turn their travel dreams into smooth and affordable reality, we say what month we filmed our show, because then you can get a sense of what are the trails like, how crowded is it, what are people wearing, and so on. The confusion this year is we show the month, in this case, I think it was July and August, and we show the year it was copywritten, 2020, and people are thinking, oh, were you shooting during COVID? No, this was filmed in 2019 in July and August, and 2020 is the copyright. After the credits and everything, there's two little blips. One thanks OPB, that's Oregon Public Broadcasting in Portland, because Oregon Public Broadcasting has been our presenting station. It's just nice if you're ever wanting to make a TV show to have a station say, here you go, we'd like to introduce this outfit to the network. And for 30 years, our friends in Portland at OPB have been our presenting station. And after that, we thank APT, American Public Broadcasting 
or American public television. And a lot of people think we're PBS. It's just kind of synonymous with public television, but it's not quite right. PBS is a distributor of quality programming, just like APT is a distributor of quality public programming that goes to all of the public television stations. So we like to distinguish that we're with our good friends in Boston at APT, and that's how stations all over the United States get our shows. So let's now remember that we're gonna keep on traveling. Keep on traveling. To know that there are places like this that embrace their traditions, it makes me want to answer the phone. Oh. And there we go. Well, once again, I'm just having a blast sharing the fun we have making our shows with all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. I do want to remind you that we do this every Monday and uh, you know, a lot of people want to join us. So we have two different times, the same show twice, one at six and one at 7.30 Seattle time. And now I'm going to turn it back to my friend, Ben, and we're going to answer some questions. Hey, Ben. That was just excellent, Rick. Thank you so much. Um, before we get to the many viewer questions, uh, how about a word from our sponsor? What's new at Rick Steves Europe these days? Well, thank you, Ben. And uh, yeah, we are a tour company that has no revenue this year. That's no fun. And there's a lot of hardworking companies that are having a tough year this year. 2019 was our best year ever. We took 30,000 people on our tours, 1,200 different tours. This year, we had pretty much three quarters of our tours sold out by January for 2020 and we had to send everybody back their deposits. And uh, we told them, we just have to be patient. We'll be here, we'll be standing when we get through this pandemic. So we've got, uh, we're keeping our staff together. You and a hundred other people are working with us at Rick Steves Europe. And we are confident that we're gonna get through this pandemic and we're gonna be bringing people to Europe again as we know and love. By the way, we made this for 2020 and it's a beautiful 64 page, colorful way to browse through all of our tours. We have 40 different itineraries. Uh, for 2021, we didn't do a print version. Um, we haven't had any revenue to pay for a print version, but we've got this available as a PDF for 2021. And people are more than welcome to go to ricksteves.com and they can even check out our Switzerland tour, which is one of our newer tours and quite popular. A couple of books that we have written in the last year that I'm very excited about, and they're not guidebooks. Guidebooks are not selling for until we get going again, but these books are both selling quite well. This book is Europe's top 100 masterpieces. And I partnered with my good buddy, Gene Openshaw, who's one of our lead guides and our sort of in-house scholar. And we collected my 100 favorite pieces of art. And with Gene's help, we wrote finely crafted descriptions of this. And you, if you like art, or even if you don't know how great art is yet, you can sit down and enjoy a sweep through European art history from the pyramids to Picasso. And that's just a fun book that we're so excited to have out. I should remind people that we're unusual because we have a TV series that we can key in. And in the back of the book, uh, there is a, let me see if I can even find it. There's a um, key that shows you where all of our um, Class from Europe clips are. And I can't even find it in all the stuff in the back of the book here. But we have, uh, for each of these pieces of art, a TV clip that would show you in video form what that art's all about also. And you can go to Classroom Europe and find 500 clips that you can search and uh, gather together. This is another book that we just published this year. I locked myself down last year not knowing we'd be locked down this year to write this book. And this is something I've wanted to do for ages. This is a 400 page collection of all my favorite articles, my favorite experiences in Europe. And what I did was I collected my 100 favorite articles and then I swept through all the practical information. I'm so wired to add, add practical tips. This is just the magic of travel. I did it locked down last year 
And it actually turns out really nice this year for travelers who are locked down and want a little daily dose of Europe. You got 100 daily doses of Europe in this book, and that is for the love of Europe. You know, this is a time when we are keeping our travel dreams alive, and that's something we're working at hard at Europe for the Back Door. I actually, believe it or not, have a calendar. And it's calendar season. If you got a traveler on your gift list, everything is on sale in our website. We got the page a day calendar and we've got the uh, wall hanging calendar. But of course, this will have a lot of uh, practical European insights woven into that calendar. So you know when the European holidays are and the American holidays at the same time. So that's your um, friendly message from your sponsor today, Rick Steves Europe. If you want any more information on that, check out our website at ricksteves.com. Ben. Let's answer some questions. All right, Rick. Um, you know, a lot of our viewers uh, astutely uh, observe that Switzerland has a reputation as an expensive country. Um, what would you say to people who are concerned about keeping their wallet in decent shape? And, and do you have any budget tips for them? Yeah, Switzerland is expensive. It's not on the Eurozone. So you'll save a little money if you change money and use Swiss francs. Swiss are great bankers, as you know, and they'll, they'll uh, take your euros, but they'll give you a lousy exchange rate. So you'll save a few percent right off the bat by using Swiss francs. Remember, Switzerland is cruelly expensive, but they can market things efficiently. And in their supermarkets, things are actually quite affordable. And uh, most, uh, so many people just do more picnicking than restaurant dining. Uh, accommodations, Switzerland knows how to make uh, dormitory type accommodations for people of any age. You got hostels, you got what's called mat rats and lagers, mattress lofts where people just get a mattress and so on. And some very simple mountain chalet kind of places where it's not that much more expensive than other countries, but it's sparse, it's very simple. Remember the lifts can be expensive, but when you're out hiking, all you're spending is your bread, your cheese, your, 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 your water's free and your Toblerone ice cream. So you're gonna spend entire days without spending any money except for the lift you took to get to the top of the top of the mountain and then hike around. So it's expensive, but it can certainly be done on a budget. Um, Rick, a few of our viewers have asked about uh, souvenirs. Uh, do you have a favorite travel souvenir? In Switzerland, um, I drink most of my souvenirs <laughs> or edible souvenirs, or I like to write journals and so on. Uh, when I was a little kid, I just had this. Uh, this is my souvenir from Switzerland when I was 14 years old. I went there with my parents, a little felt hat with all of the, the pins from each country. Those are kind of fun. Wow, this goes back to 1969. I don't know if people even buy pins for a felt hat anymore. But to answer your question, Ben, I got done with souvenirs a long time ago. My best souvenir is to fly home with a broader perspective with an empathy and an understanding and a playful friendship with the people I got to know on this trip. I love it. In Europe, they say strangers are just friends who've yet to meet. And when we travel, we get to know the world. That's the best souvenir. So sure, buy your goofy little souvenirs if you want to, but I'd rather make friends, collect addresses, and come home with that broader perspective. Uh, Rick, a few viewers as well asked about shoes and hiking boots. Do you have any preferred brand, anything you particularly enjoy wearing? You know, I'm, there's so many people that have so many strong feelings about shoes. And we have forums on our website where people share all their ideas about shoes. But people want to know what I, I wear echoes. I really like my echoes. And they can be heavy duty echoes or lighter echoes. Uh, but those are really good for me. The most important thing is spend good money on a good solid pair of shoes and don't do it on the way to the airport. Have it broken in. Make sure you know when you like your shoes before you commit yourself to a whole tour with those shoes. Uh, Rick, you noted your uh, voice decline earlier. Um, we had a few people asking about dealing with being sick while traveling. Um, do you have any thoughts on how to deal with that frustration? Okay, well, here's, on this last trip, I was in the Alps for 18 days filming, and I couldn't shake this uh, virus I had. I don't even know what it was, but twice at hotels, I told them I'm not feeling well, I need to get help. Hotels are used to that. They're in the business of keeping their travelers uh, sheltered and well-fed and healthy. And uh, in each case, they would call the local clinic and set me up with an appointment, and I would go in the next morning. 
it's never expensive because Europe has great healthcare and it's just a token fee. And then you get a, a very capable doctor who speaks English and diagnoses what you got and gives you uh, a prescription for the medicine you need. So we didn't know what was going on, but it was some kind of virus, I guess. And, uh, but as far as my voice goes, I just kept working right through it, like I'm inclined to do. And I think that's what I did. I had a virus. I kept working really hard. I was just in Scotland before the, the day before meeting my crew uh, to start the Alpine shoot. shoot. And um, I just got that little nudge and um, uh, I was just always aware that I could get medical help when I needed it. Uh, and I would say anywhere in Europe, don't be a hero. If you're not feeling well, talk to the people at your hotel and take off half a day and go to the clinic and get fixed up. 90% of the time, you just need to have a doctor look at you and prescribe some medicine and then you're on your way. Um, Rick, um, a lot of people are curious about your travel schedule. Um, how do you decide where to go each year? Well, in norm this year is the oddity then because of course I didn't go anywhere this year, but on a normal year, like the last 30 years, I dedicate 100 days to Europe. And it's basically April and May in the Mediterranean, July and August, north of the Alps. If you wonder when I'm shooting a TV show, I can't remember when I shot these TV shows, but I can derive it from my schedule. If it's in the Mediterranean region, it was in April or May. If it's in the Alps or north of the Alps, it's always in July or August, all right? So uh, it's just too hot and crowded to be in the Mediterranean area in the summer. And north of the Alps, you want long days, and frankly, you want tourist crowds. You want things open and vibrant, so that's, that's important. Um, so uh, I spend my, my time, I divide my 100 days basically between three missions. Work on my tour program. We've got 100 wonderful guides. We take 30,000 people to Europe on a great year. Um, we, we have 30 to 40 different itineraries. It's a huge responsibility. I'm very excited about our tour program. Uh, a third of my time, I'm with my TV crew. It takes six days to shoot one of these half hour shows and we shoot on average six or seven of these shows every year. We've done that for the last 30 years. And one third of my time is all on my own researching my guidebooks. And I'm just traveling alone, but I'm partnering with guides almost every day as I run around Europe with these guidebooks. I mean, you know, I've got the Switzerland guidebook. There's a lot of information to check in there and everything has to be visited and everything has to be uh, compared to what else is available. It's, it's a, you wear out a lot of shoes uh, checking out all this information. It's very rewarding because thousands of people end up using it and it works well for them. Now, uh, Rick, we have time for one more question. Uh, I know you have a great appreciation for music. Was that Alphorn difficult to play? And do you have any advice for the future Alphorn players in the audience? It's funny you ask, Ben, because I was just thinking it would be fun to have an Alphorn here. I, I have a deck that overlooks my town, and I would love to be able to... And when you think about that Alpine, as I explained, if you know how to play a trumpet or a bugle, you know, the difference between a bugle and a trumpet is no valves. You can play a bugle with a trumpet, just don't wiggle the valves, right? Because that's the harmonic overtone series. And that's what the Alphorn does. So if you can play a trumpet, you, it's the same mouthpiece. And you just, the tricky thing about an Alphorn is you've got to hear the interval. If you can hear a fifth and a fourth and a third, you know, that's what it is. C, G, C, E. If you can hear it, it's the think method, if you remember that movie, uh, whatever it was, the uh, music man. And if you think it right, you hit it. It's great. If you don't think it right, it sounds horrible. So these guys know how to think it and then play it. So it's, you know, it is so fun just to have so many great travelers with us. And uh, on, on behalf of all of us at Rick Steves Europe, uh, Ben, thank you for uh, helping uh, doing all the tech work and making this happen. And thank everybody for joining us. We want to remind you, this show is recorded and then it lives on our website and we post it tomorrow on Facebook. And every Monday, it's Monday Night Travel. And we've got a lot of great travels coming up. So I'll just say, happy travels, even if we're all just staying home for a while. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.